And thank you for joining. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this seminar presented by our Pension and Financial Wellness Committee. ART is pleased to offer a series of financial wellness seminars throughout the year to create education opportunities specific to retiree wellness. Since ARTA was formed in 1963, we focused on supporting our members in an engaged and active lifestyle in retirement. Our holistic approach includes one of the best benefit plans in the country, as well as many additional programs and services, including our discount program, physical wellness events, social opportunities offered through our regional branches, scholarships for family members, and of course, seminars just like this one. ARTA also serves as an advocate for teachers and retirees using our collective voice to draw attention to the ATRF and teachers' pensions, the Seniors Drug Plan, the Choice in Education Act, and most recently, curriculum development. There are many different factors that allow ARTA to maintain such a wide reach, but in the end, it all boils down to our organization's financial wellness and sustainability. As a nonprofit organization, we take any surpluses we generate and put them right back into the benefits plan. And because we were created by retired teachers for retired teachers and like-minded professionals, we remain dedicated to retirees. With that, I'll pass things off to the chair of Artist Pension and Financial Wellness Committee, Ray Hoger. Good afternoon. And as Scott has mentioned, I am uh, Ray Hoger, the chair of Artist Pension Financial Wellness Committee. I'm joined by our committee members, Blair Lowry and uh, Larry Hartel, Craig Whitehead, and by artist treasurer, Lawrence Riken. As you may have noticed, we have disabled attendee video and audio capability. This will ensure a quality experience for all participants by limiting web, web streaming. It also allows us to record this webinar without breaching your privacy. With your audio muted, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. You can submit questions publicly so that all attendees can see them or submit them privately and then only the artist staff will be able to see them. Our team or the speaker will respond to questions at the end of the webinar. A reminder for participants that this presentation is for informational purposes only and should not be used to replace a consultation with a trained legal tax or financial professional. Please contact a professional for financial tax or legal advice related to your specific circumstances. With those housekeeping matters completed, I would like to turn or welcome today's speaker, Laurie Bauer. Laurie is a business development manager for Orbit Insurance Services and is the ARTA account manager. Laurie is a seasoned insurance professional who started her insurance career almost 30 years ago. She has her level two general insurance license, is a graduate of the Canadian Accredited Insurance Broker Program, and is expanding her insurance knowledge through the Insurance Institute, seeking her chartered insurance professional designation. In her spare time, Lori loves to spend time with family and grandchildren, as well as reading, gardening, golfing, struggling with crossword puzzles, crocheting, exercising, and playing with her Boston Terrier, Diego. Whew, I'm retired and I can't even do half of those things. Anyway, we shall turn it now over to Lori. It's all yours. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I'm excited to be able to share some information with you. Uh, as, as Ray mentioned, I'm, I'm pursuing additional education and in insurance and I love working in the industry. It's very dynamic and it's constantly evolving to meet the challenges we are facing in society today. It provides a financial backstop to many things in society. It ensures mortgages, it ensures buildings under construction, uh, airline industry, insurance has a place in almost every aspect of society, and it's greatly impacted by the environment that it operates in. We'll be discussing some of the challenges we're facing today and how insurance plays into those challenges. Let's start because we have a lot to get through. All right, so if you're not familiar with it, this is the um, our, our new branding with Orbit Insurance Services, uh, we were TW Insurance Services until 2023, and then we rebranded to Orbit, where we revolve around you. We've also been working with ARDA since 2013. We're proud to serve them for the last 10 years, heading to 11. And what we've done is take all the great things about TW and expand it. So now we offer 
a greater selection of products, more experts, and we have greater presence across the country. So we're able to serve you from coast to coast to coast. So we're delighted to be able to work with ARDA and its members. On the agenda for today, we're going to talk about the challenges within cyber, pardon me, the challenges with auto and climate challenges. So let's start with cyber. We're going to spend the most time here. Um, it's the newest one. So let's talk about that one. So some of the terms we're going to talk about, most of you are familiar with most of these terms, but there's a few that are new. And unfortunately, there are uh, more terms and things to discuss than we have time to do that with. But um, let's just start. Cybercrime, it's sort of the overarching concept. Think mail fraud back in the days of the mafia and Capone. So that's kind of the big, big concept is that. A cyber attack is successful. A cyber incident is perhaps successful, perhaps not. But it's a breach. It's uh, somebody... Um, illegally accessing computers, internet, or network devices. A data breach is just that. Data is illegally obtained. Phishing, smishing, and vishing. This is, uh, phishing is um, an attack through email. Smishing is a cyber attack through text. And vishing is voice. So now someone can use a voice activated through the phone, call you, and... Um, be deceptive or fraudulent with that. Cyberbullying, this is a newer term, certainly something. And if you don't think that you could ever be the victim of a cyberbullying incident because, you know, that's not something you have, you don't, you don't do that much online, uh, keep in mind that Airbnb just said that they can't have uh, security cameras in their units anymore and internal ones. So it's possible that somebody has images of you that, you that you wouldn't want shared out on the internet. And that's essentially what cyberbullying is, bullying or harassment that takes place online with people posting embarrassing photos, unkind comments, things like that. So just another term to learn and something to be aware of. So cybercrime is serious business. Um, Scary numbers, actually. And uh, I'm not sure if, if the timing is is uh, by chance or intentional, but March is Fraud Prevention Month and has been for many years. As you can see, 24 years they've been fighting fraud uh, in March. <laughs> I'm sure they do it all year. Uh, so 2023, there were about 62,000 reports of fraud. That's good in that there were 92,000 reports of fraud in 2022. Having said that, there's still um, there was more money that was stolen. Um, this is through uh, the the Canadian uh, Cyber. Which one? This is the Canadian Anti Fraud Report, and this one. Uh, this is all fraud numbers. This is not just. Um, we're not talking cyber alone. About seventy percent of those losses are um, through cyber. But this is um, reported losses. It's unknown how much has actually been um, stolen in this way. And it's it's chronically underreported because people are embarrassed, right? They get taken advantage of and, and they're not real proud of that. So um, that's we know that there's more. And almost half of Canadians have experienced a cyber crime. That's a significant number of us being impacted, even though we're more than aware, we're being told, but it's because things are changing and it's evolving. So when we look at updates within cyber, so what's going on in the cyber insurance market? Because if there's a problem, there's an insurance product to solve the problem. So um, what happened uh, very recently is that the insurance wordings were updated to exclude um, Bitcoin, uh, which is BTC, um, and NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens. They were never intended to be covered through insurance. Uh, they were erroneously covered because they weren't excluded. That's kind of how insurance works. When insurance was developed and built, nobody had any idea of a Bitcoin or a, a digital ledger or any of those things. And, and there's another reason that NFTs and that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily fit into insurance in that 
an NFT is a, it's, if it's essentially the digital ownership of an asset that is similar to a real world asset, like artwork or things like that. Like Jack Dorsey, the Twitter guy, he sold his first tweet as an F NFT for $2.9 million. Well, I wouldn't want to insure that. Like, what's the basis of that value? And it's, it's replicable everywhere. Only one person can own the original, much like the Mona Lisa still kind of works in that fashion. But this is just like conceptual, intangible. So now your insurance policy does not cover those. It did until it didn't. Uh, the cyber insurance market is improving, uh, which is very good news. Very good news. At the end of 2020, the cyber insurance market loss ratio, so for $1 taken in, $4 were paid out. So a 400% loss ratio, which is unsustainable in the insurance market. And if insurance is unsustainable or unaffordable and it's not available, then people work with it. businesses operate without it. If they're operating without it, then that means you're at risk. The more they put in to be safe on their side businesses, the safer as consumers we are. On that note, they've developed uh, personal cyber coverage. Um, initially, it was pretty much called identity theft, and it covered, you know, the costs associated with um, reestablishing your, your identity, should that have been stolen in one of many ways. Well, that's, um, identity theft is just a small part of, that's a small part of it. Now, there's all kinds of, of additional threats, and not only that, they've expanded beyond what they were originally, they used to be. So, uh, it used to be that most of the cybercrime existed within your banking app, say, or, you know, money came out of your bank account. Well, now uh, the threat has changed and now your bank might be safe and there's all kinds of security on that. But maybe you got a link from somebody and said your payment was missing and then you click that link and you went to a malicious website. Well, the bank isn't going to cover you for that because that's not their website. So that was why personal cyber coverage was developed. And I'm sure all of you have heard of AI and the threats and the possibilities and all that we're imagining about AI. And of course, we would hope that AI would decrease threats, but of course it won't. It's going to increase that threats. And when you think about vishing voice, uh, it's going to get better and better. It's improving uh, the phishing emails. Uh, it's fine tuning it. It used to be that like those, you know, I am African, an African prince. Those are long, like that is old. The newest phishing and smishing is so sophisticated. It's really hard to figure out if it's a legitimate or a not a legitimate threat. I wanted to show you some of these data breaches because as much as we're aware of what's going on, it's not stopping the, the problem. And when we look at some of these, um, these data breaches that we've, we've seen, this is over a billion affected individuals just on this slide, just this one. Equifax, 163 million people impacted. Uber, 57 million. And cybercrime is expected to reach, reach $8 trillion with a T dollars in 2023. I don't know if it did or it didn't. And they assume it will just continue to increase. The average ransom in a ransomware attack is $300,000. That's the average. So you know that there's some really high numbers to have made that up. And um, I was always wondered, what the heck is going on there? Are they just trying to steal SIN numbers? What, what is it? So what it is, is everything on the dark web has a value. So when a company uh, clicks a link or get something and gets ransomware, and then uh, their screen is blue and they can't access any data, and they've been had a ransomware attack. They're offered an opportunity to pay for the data to release it back, and um, if they're, you know, uh, scrupulous pirates, they will give you your data back and will not release it into the dark web if you pay ransom. If they're unscrupulous, they will take your ransom and they will still release your data. 
And if you choose not to pay it, they just sell your information on the dark web. And um, there's varying num amounts that I've seen, but I did see like 50, per 50 cents for a credit card number, $2 for a passport number. Um, it's just, there's values to all of it. So they reach in and they dig out and whatever they get, they get and they sell it on the dark web. So it's less personal than you'd like it to be. And um, more of an enterprise. Like this is a serious economy. Three trillion dollars, eight trillion dollars. That's that's a massive amount of money going to pure crime. So can insurance be hacked? Well, of course it can. <laughs> they can hack anything. I do want to point out to a few things though that are uh, more specific to insurance. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a ghost broker. Uh, ghost brokers, uh, there was very recently um, one that was announced, I think it was called NUN 2x3, and um, the superintendent of insurance put out uh, a notice that they are not a licensed insurance broker. So they offer their services online, people pay, they do whatever, they put information in, they provide the driver's license number, all of that, and they're just, there's nothing. There's They just took your money and there is no insurance. And um you know, most of us are savvy enough to know that that's not or would be aware that that's a weird way to get insurance. But for people that um, don't know, aren't sophisticated, um, are desperate or are illegally doing this. I mean, it gets you a license plate if you have a pink card. Right. So who knows why people use ghost brokers um, or if they do, but they're out there. So it, it can happen. Uh, phishing, smishing and phishing scams. Well, you know. Um, these scams are based on just the large laws, large numbers. So um, if you got a call from ABC Insurance that your payment uh, didn't go through, can can you call them back? You know, 80% of the time you didn't make a payment, you don't, not with ABC and that didn't happen. But the 20% or 10% or 2% of people that potentially are in that will call them back. And that is um, easy right? Then you call them, you give them your credit card number. I mean, it's your insurance, like you just did it. And it, it's not that they even know anything about you. It's just um, the chances of you having done it, right? They're just fishing. Again, it's fishing, fishing, just trying to get something. And insurance companies are frequent, uh, a very frequent uh, target for cyber attacks. They're repositories for tons of sensitive data, right? All the information you could ever want to, to steal an identity. And they also create their own data. So there's information within that as well. So um, insurance certainly can be hacked. Um, it certainly does do its very best to be as secure as it possibly can. Um, we're more than aware of the sensitivity, sensitivity of the information that we hold. And we certainly don't want to be um, giving that up to anybody. These are some trusted organization that if you were ever in a position that you thought that something fishy was going on like that, that you can do some checking with. The Alberta Insurance Council, they're the governance for insurance brokers in Alberta. So they will tell you if it's a legitimate company or not. Uh, the Insurance Brokers Association of Alberta, we're a proud industry and our broker association will certainly help you if you're concerned. The superintendent of insurance is our government body. They will be able to tell you that. And then the Insurance Bureau of Canada and the Insurance Bureau of Brokers Association of Canada. All of those are trusted support networks with that insurance, com insurance works with. And they can tell you if that company is legitimate, not legitimate, all of that kind of stuff. So how do we protect ourselves? Because we're going to want to, right? What are we going to do? How do we do this? Well, become your own risk manager. So in risk, when you manage a risk, you there's four principles. You accept it, you avoid it, you transfer, or you reduce. That's how you mitigate risk. You do the, one of those four things when you have risk, and then you work through that. So accepting the risk. Well, that's companies. Uh, the technological risk is companies you choose to do business with. Shopping, banking, portals, all of that kind of stuff. And there is a risk, but as I mentioned, it's getting better and better and better in that world. Uh, there's more, you know, um, there's, you can look and see if it's a trusted website, um, all of those things. 
but that is on that front, it's improving. The behavioral risk is is really where we're in trouble, if I'm honest. Um, Harvard Business Review says about 80% of cyber incidents are behavioral or human error or, you know, clicked when you shouldn't have clicked. And all cyber criminals are relying on the wet paint theory. And there's, I think it's a 50%. I'm sure most, a lot of you are familiar with the wet paint theory. And a lot of people just have to, you know, they see a link and they just, they got to touch it. They got to see if it's real. They, you know, oh, I don't know. And um, so in and sh- <laughs> that is something you have to accept. If you know yourself that you're a person that has to see, then really think about that and watch what you're doing because hackers are relying on the people with wet pain syndrome to keep them in business. The next basic principle of all of it is avoid. How do you avoid being a victim? Well, um, be on alert for phishing scams. Like, be aware of the risk that you're you're managing here. Be aware. Um, Online friendships and social media. You know, your friend from 20 years ago isn't going to call you up and say, oh, my God, I've been kidnapped. I need Xbox cards. Like, don't don't fall for the easy ones. Um, there's enough sophisticated ones that we can try and avoid the simple ones. Uh, trust your gut. When you're going on websites, it, you know, Uggs are not going to be $20 on a website. Um, you're not going to get $200 sunglasses for $10. That Those are malicious websites. Have some faith in yourself. Like, you know what you know. And have some faith and go with your gut on these things. And don't think before you click. That's a big one. Think before you click. transfer well that's what i do you transfer your risk to me when you buy insurance that's what happens you're transferring your risk you're saying i have this risk you insure it and then you pay them money and they take care of that risk for you so personal cyber is emerging beyond the original identity theft um, because the threats have emerged so more you have to have more products and services to cover Um, banks aren't always covering it anymore. As I mentioned, uh, if you click on a malicious link, the bank does not have that same duty to, um, put you right uh, if something gets stolen. Now, the ones I'm familiar with, as far as cyber insurance is concerned, is really an endorsement on your existing homeowner's policy. That's what I've seen so far. I'm sure standalone coverage exists. I'm not familiar with it, to be honest, but I'm sure it does. Uh, cyber claims, all kind of insurance claims are immediately reported. Don't admit anything and don't pay. That's the law of insurance. Never. You, when you uh, turn your risk over to insurance, you're turning that part of it over to the insurance company too. They are going to respond on your behalf. And a cyber endorsement, the one I'm familiar, most familiar with is the Aviva one. And Aviva has actually contracted a company or has a third party provider for the coverage. Because I'm going to tell you that a, a regular home and auto adjuster, they're not real sure on this cyber stuff either. This is pretty intense. You know, a, a cyber extortion event, you know, some guy wants 12 Bitcoin at $62,000 a pop. Where do you get those? Like, these are not things that we're familiar with. This is not our world. But the companies they can, are working with, they know what to do. They know how to handle it. They know which uh, hackers will give you your data back, which won't. Uh, they're familiar with it. So it's if it's available to you and you want to include it in your coverage, it, it sure would be better to have than worse to have, right? Um, I don't, uh, we don't have it as a standalone in our brokerage and um, it has a separate limit. It's a, a separate insurance or an endorsement um, for that kind of uh, coverage. And it does cover cyber bullying, cyber extortion, ransom attacks, things like that. And also helps you, uh, get your identity back um, if you have legal costs and things like that associated with that, because that's another thing you have to go through the rigmarole to um, go and get all of that stuff done. And again, you're in a world you're probably not that familiar with, so it's a bit challenging. This one, I um, I I will say that I I would like to tell you about it. Uh, I have to thank Ron Thompson from Harda for uh, bringing this up to me. Um, 
I am not that familiar with title insurance because it is not a product we shall sell in our insurance office, nor any other insurance office. It's a product that's available through a lawyer. And it um, essentially most people purchase it when uh, buy it when they purchase a property. It is available to you after you own a property. So it, you know, you can certainly look at your own set of circumstances and consider whether you want it or not. But um, your homeowner's insurance does not cover your title. In fact, it ex excludes your title. Evidence of title is, is not, um, through trickery, is not um, one of the things that's covered on your insurance policy. So title insurance covers title issues, off-title issues, and transactional issues. So your title would be encumbrances or liens to the title, right on that title. Um, off title would be encroachment or easement, uh, unpermitted work. So it responds to it. It's should that occur. So um, a lot of you probably, if you've been in a community for many years, have had the same neighbors for many years. And then the new neighbor moves in and all of a sudden uh, they're like, is your deck on my property? And that that can be handled uh, through that. And then transactional is more like title fraud. Uh, so someone steals your identity and then they transfer title. And now you don't own your own home anymore. Oh my goodness, right? That will help you there as well. You buy it once, it's for the term of the policy. And uh, again, um, thank you, Ron, for bringing this to my attention because it's valuable in the big picture. I guess it's very common in Ontario, less so in Alberta, but, or or maybe I just don't know. That's That's real possible too. And reduce. This is the fourth principle in our, our risk management strategy is reduce. So doing nothing is no longer an option. None of us are able to say, well, I don't know. I didn't realize that. It's that's that's the we can't think like that. You need to do things that are going to make it difficult for them to steal your data or for you to become a victim of a cybercrime. So if you use technology, you need to do this part too, and you need to do uh, add some layers of security. I wouldn't say one is good enough. I wouldn't even say two is, but three or four, we're starting to get in a position where you've become a little more difficult to deal with. So um, I know multi-factor authentication is a pain, a pain in the butt. That's why it's good for you. That's why it's good, hard for them too. Uh, enabling your antivirus software. Uh, install your updates. This I I am an evangelist for this particular one because I found out that, and, and especially on my personal devices, work I do what I'm told. My personal devices, I'm a bit of a wet painter. So of course, uh, install updates. Well, then it pops out my password. That's too much work. I found out that week one, you get the patch or the update. That's what gets released into, say, Google Play. I'm not Apple. And um, week one, they send the update. Week two, they send the vulnerabilities, a big long list of all the vulnerabilities that existed that that update uh, took care of. So the people that are looking to hack, they read week two. And then any people that didn't update in week one, they know are easy targets. And there's a lot of software that we're using or apps that we're using that are very common, right? Not, I mean, not all of them. We all have some uniqueness, but um, so if I can share one thing, it's update, install your update. So it's really, it's, it's just this, have them automatically update. It's the simplest way you can add a layer of protection and foil your enemies and stay in the know. Like, Half of this is that you just don't know about it, right? How would you know? Well, find a way to know. There's all kinds of, the government has amazing cyber safe on the government website, Canadian Anti-Fraud. All of those are really good websites, very usable. You can do uh, a cyber hygiene test to make sure you, you know, that you're in a good place. Uh, find out how vulnerable you are. Some websites even you can go on and find out if you've been hacked. Um, I think it's called P, it looks like owned, but with a P at the beginning of it. And you can find out if your data is out there, like if if someone has, has stolen that. Um, change those passwords, make them hard. Don't use your grandchildren's name, don't use your pet's name, all of that stuff. 
be difficult, right? Don't uh, be harder than the next guy. Be harder than the guy sitting next to you. <laughs> Make it a little tricky for them. Okay. So hopefully you feel more informed about cyber, you know, comfortable with what's going on in the cyber insurance ecosystem. And we've got some tools. I think we can move on. So let's move on and talk about auto. Auto is always going to be uh, interesting and challenging at the same time. Uh, auto insurance is a mandatory um, if you drive a car, you must have liability insurance. Uh, in Alberta, the minimum insurance amount is $200,000. The insurance companies don't price it for that to be um, a good number. It's actually dollars more to have a million or $2 more or $2 million. It, it's not going to save you money by reducing it to uh, the minimum. And it's not a lot of coverage anyway, $200,000 nowadays. So the Alberta government is consumer focused and they are looking to correct this auto thing because it's a wedge issue. Every election it comes up, um, it's become unaffordable for people. It's not sustainable. And everyone needs to have the coverage who drives a vehicle. One of the mandates of the insurance rate board is to provide an accessible, affordable, sustainable product that's consumer fo focused. So we're trying to do that. When they introduced the grid, that was the solution at the time. It's not so much the solution anymore, but we need to find a way to work with it. So let's explore what's going on with auto. Let's start there. So we came out of a rate freeze and we got into a rate cap. So that's for good drivers. And uh, the government has introduced this uh, rate cap, 3.7%. And they qualified what who who is able to receive that, and that would be uh, a good driver who has had no at fault claims in six years, no criminal code convictions in four years. Uh, criminal code would be uh, impaired driving. Let's say that uh, no major traffic conviction in three years. Uh, distracted driving is uh, would be considered a major conviction, and no more than one minor conviction or speeding ticket in three years. So those are sort of the uh, the parameters that they're working with. If you do all of those things, the government says that you are entitled to um, to uh, have your rates um, not go up by more than 3.7%. Uh, so bad news first, uh, there are a lot of people who have uh, distracted driving tickets. A lot, a lot, a lot of people. And um, that's because um, distracted driving is dangerous. And there was a real crackdown on it. Having said that, it's also somewhat subjective. Um, you know, it's not uh, a means like, oh, you were going 20 kilometers over. Uh, you know, you might have been drinking your coffee one day and not got a ticket. And the next day you might. Or you picked up your phone and you got a ticket or you didn't. At any rate, it's a significant um, uh, cost to have that. And it also disqualifies you for good driving uh, credits. So. And let's face it, don't do it. Don't don't be distracted driving. Be focused driving. That that should be in the new statement. Be a focused driver. Uh, the basic premiums because of the rate freeze. Basic premiums are the grid rate, so that's just liability. Like the 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 base most basic premiums, they've increased by twelve percent. Uh, most of you, after a few years of driving history, aren't really impacted by the grid premium because uh, competition means insurance companies want will actually offer you a better rate of insurance than, than this. The grid, think of the maximum allowable chargeable premium. This is the most in Alberta anybody can charge. This is it. Um, the grid, if you're not familiar with it, uh, runs on a scale of minus 15 to plus 15, minus 15 being preferable, plus 15 being terrifying. But um, it, it can happen. Life happens, right? Um, none of us want to be a plus 15 on the grid but it's there, so somebody is. The problem is, is that those premiums are subsidized by the minus 15s, and unfortunately, um, it's working out that the minus 15s are paying more than their fair share. So in terms of that, and because, you know, we've had rate pause and rate freeze and rate this and rate that, and all of this, like, back and forth and, and uh, knockdown fighting with all of these um, they're actually 
thank goodness, looking at the product, which is what everybody's been asking to do, look at it and see if this is a sustainable product in the, in the fashion it is today, is it sustainable? And the government is committed to uh, reviewing it to ensure that it does have sustainability. It's important to them as well. It also comes up at every election and you know they'd like to talk about other things. Um, I'm in Alberta, I will hold my tongue as to what else is going on, but uh, let's just say that I'm hopeful that this will create um, a good system for us and we can all be, I'm a consumer of auto insurance myself, so I totally understand that people are frustrated with all of what's going on and all these weird rules and everything, but um, it does require some kind of reform to to fix the system. Um, and so hopefully we'll get there. I don't know if anybody uh, belongs. There's a group called Fair Alberta, F-A-I-R, Fair Alberta. Um, it's it's uh, the majority. I think it's funded or founded by the Alberta Civil Trial Lawyers Association. And um, they, of course, are my total adversary. That's the uh, complete other side of the coin to what I do um, in in my world. But I totally respect their position um, because they see a different side of it. And much like I'm not union, but unions have made my life better. The trial lawyers uh, keep insurance companies uh, mindful of paying fair settlements so that you don't have to go to court every time there's an issue. Um, so they have their part in all of this, too. They're terribly concerned that um, the government will switch to a no-fault system similar to Ontario. Um, and their concern is, of course, they get cut out of the picture, which I understand why they say that. But I I don't have, I, I wish I did. I don't have an insight into what they're thinking or what they're doing. Uh, they've had three postponements. So I'm saying, I'm wondering if they know what they're doing at this point. But um, we're now being told it should be by the end of March that we should hear. No, oh, here we're at the end of March. Okay, let's go to April because we haven't heard anything yet. Ah, so I have a new and not happy thing to share with you. And you've probably seen it because you read the news just like I do. Um, we're in a, a real crisis with auto theft. It's, it's, it was a real problem in Alberta, but it hit Ontario and Quebec. So it, it's, um, they have a lot more people than us. Uh, $1.2 billion was paid out last year, in 2022, sorry, uh, for auto thefts. Um, which is a 300% increase. Uh, it, it is such a big problem that everybody is throwing their hands up in the air and throwing their hands around each other. And what we know is that it requires a whole of society effort to solve this. Um, the, one of the biggest problems is we have the technology to fix this, right? Most vehicles have a disabling tool on their cars. We don't have any uh, motor safety regulations to support that. They were implemented in around 2007. And for those that have been following insurance, that's about when Ford started, had to get a handle on their theft. So that's about the last time there was radical change within that. Um, we need, they, we need uh, significant change to be able to um, uh, help it. We, we found out or we learned that when a car is stolen in Canada, that doesn't, nobody was just telling anybody else um, outside of Canada. So now we report them. So nobody could have ever found our stolen vehicles because only Canadians, like the Canadian system it was stolen in the, it, it wasn't information that was shared. And even that took some time. Um, I was on a webinar with uh, a number of people, uh, the head of Toyota, one of the Toyota Canada, um, what they want to do is um, on the app, the driving app, your car app, you report it stolen and uh, and then they take it over from there. Uh, the challenge with that, of course, is uh, vigilantism. So what they want is that when you do report the vehicle stolen, it uh, disables the owner screen so that people aren't trying to find their cars and all of that. So that's challenging. But all of this requires um, legislative change. We can't just do things overnight. So I'm hopeful that um, that we'll be able to do something. Another thing uh, Aviva's doing to combat this is that um, they get 
Uh, so your vehicle gets stolen. Aviva writes you a check. The thief has your car. It's on a container ship. It's gone. It's being sold somewhere else. So, and someone else is selling the vehicle to fund crime, whatever they're doing. It's it's all dark money. It's not a good, they're not like stealing them to give them to, they're not Robin Hood. Um, so uh, in this case, what Aviva wants to do is pursue and recover those vehicles. Go take them out of the hands of the thieves because it, if you can stop the money, you can stop the problem. Or at least you have more of an opportunity to. Um, letting them keep the car after they've stolen it is really not fair. Revinning, I think this has come around and come back again. I think we we fixed this and now we didn't. So most of the cars they steal, they're gone, out of Canada. Never going to see them again. But some don't. And then they resell them, but they put a new VIN on. They steal that too, just so you know. Um, why that's terrible, you won't know. And if you get caught with it, they're taking your possess they're taking your car because it's a proceeds of crime. You're getting no money back. And uh, that's just one way where they're doing it. Relay attacks, uh, that one, if you have one of those little pouches, the protector pouches, and I know uh, if you're on social media, the poor Toronto police just got lambasted because they said, hey, put that thing right at the front door. That way you won't get a home invasion. Now, there was a lot of fury about that. And, oh, that's all you're going to do for us? Well, they can't really help the laws. I mean, they're arresting people for doing these crimes. These criminals are right back out the door. So it's, it's you know, the police are just telling you how to stay safe. The police take care of us and, and deal with the laws that exist. What I've heard from everybody in this is be difficult. Be difficult. Put in a club, put on, you do anything you can to have your vehicle not get stolen. That's that's the rules today. Be difficult. Make it hard for them. Make them go to the next car, whatever it is. Don't. Yeah, that's the best thing I can tell you. To combat it. Make sure make it hard for them. Park in your garage. Don't park on the street if you don't have to. Climate. Let's move on. Enough of stolen cars. Let's talk about something happy. <laughs> the climate. It is happy. I think the climate is a great thing. We're at the nature in insurance. We're at the mercy of it. We're insurance. All of us are at the mercy of the weather. It does what it wants to do. If you're in Alberta, it'll do four things before noon. So it's really a challenge here. So this, I'm sure many of you have seen. This is our catastrophic losses. This is um, the Insurance Bureau of Canada creates these beautiful infographics. Um, this is the insured catastrophic losses in 2022. A cat catastrophic loss by an insurance company rate standard is $30 million minimum. That's the loss. So there's lots of other losses as well, but this is over that threshold. Um, 3.1, there are all kinds of new ones. Just learning all the time, aren't we? So uh, duress show, uh, bomb cyclone, king tides, we're learning all these new things. You can see a lot of what insurance deals with on the mass scale is water, wet, water, thunder, water, wet severe so that was 2022 i do not have a happy story for 2023 i'm afraid um 3.1 billion you know when i first started doing this these were not even numbers that we could have been ever amount this this didn't exist this is a drastic change a drastic change so last year we had the north burnt that was sad we had a lot of fires last year i mean it is partially cyclical as well to the degree that if there's a fire one year, there's likely a flood the next, like that is part of it. So it does feed itself, right? I mean, that's a challenge. Uh, and then there's another, you know, just to add to this, um, there's no doubt the frequency and severity and the weather events are increasing and all of that. But we also have an environment of incredible inflation. We've got supply chain challenges, chain challenges. Um, there's more to the cost than just the storms, which is in no way me saying that there's no climate change. This is not mattering, all of that. I'm just saying that there are a lot of things that go into the insured costs. And we cannot in ignore the fact that, you know, um, everybody wants these same materials at the same time. So we have all the scarcity, um, lots of things go into that. But what we're seeing is no reduction. It is not getting better. We're not seeing, oh, it's it's all better now and it's going to get better. 
So what do we do about that? Because I know that the audience that is sitting here today, I know you are climate stewards. I know that I'm sitting with a group of the people that have done everything they can to, to stop this and they are doing everything. So what can you do? Well, be climate prepared in that, know your own risks. If you need sewer backup coverage, overland water, flood coverage, earthquake coverage, know what your risks are, price them out, determine if you're gonna insure it or not, understand what it'll cover, what's your deductible, know this stuff so that if it happens to you, you're okay. Um, green endorsements, this is kind of, it's asking people to pay more money for their insurance, right? An endorsement is adding coverage to your policy in most cases. And, um, but this one, it, it really is, uh, insurance is based on the principle of indemnity, which is restoring you back to the state you were in before anything happened. Um, so upgrading your fixed or upgrading your shingles, you can see is not an in, within the indemnity concept. But um, if you wanted to pay for more, you could. Like if, if your shingles are ripped off and your insurance company settles a claim, you can pay the difference, but that's not really comfortable. A green endorsement with almost any insurance company, most of them offer it now to some degree, will in, build back with better materials, with eco-friendly materials, all of that. Um, the other things that are coming is, is just more awareness, right? Uh, real estate listings, we'll have to start talking about being built on a floodplain. Like try and find that in a real estate listing. Oh, floods every, you know, two weeks, leaky base. Like that, you're going to read all the best things on your real estate listing, not all of the problems. So um, more information like that. The other thing we're um, waiting to see more on, uh, the federal government announced the national flood program because there's about I think, 10 to 20% of the market can't even have flood insurance because the risk is just too substantial. The, um, the national flood program that the feds are going to be funding will create a database. It's going to create uh, an insurance, but I mean, a reinsurance company to be able to support flood insurance. But that work needs to be getting on it. And we haven't really seen anything on it yet. So I'm hopeful. I mean, there's certainly been a lot in our world that we've had to deal with. So it's, it's understandable that it isn't all in place now, but it is important that we find out because the more that insurance takes on, the less the federal government um, pays for. So that's it's in their best interest to get it moving forward. So that was a lot. I know it was, but that's it. Uh, and, you know, if I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you have them, uh, if I can answer it today, I'd love to. If I have to get back to you, we'll certainly... Um, We'll do that. Uh, yeah. All right. So thank you. So, Lori, uh, there is the one, two questions that are by the same person. Uh, are we not already under uh, something like a no-fault insurance? For instance, if you're in an accident, uh, regardless of who is at fault, your insurance will pay for damages and supposedly pursue the other driver. However, how often does this actually happen anymore? Right. So um, we're in a, in a modified, we're sort of in a step down. So we're at the uh, direct compensation for property damage. So it is, um, it is not a no fault. It is um, that regardless of fault, the payment is through your insurance company. So your insurance, uh, if you're insured with Aviva, Aviva will pay the claim. Um, what no fault does is it, in some cases, and the, what the Trial Lawyers Association is specifically talking about is their, your ability to litigate for additional uh, costs or to be able to sue people. So for um, damage in excess of what the normal payment would be on the policy. So, cause that's what, what you're doing when you go and, and you go and litigate or you take it to um, the trial, you know, the lawyer, um, your insurance company is going to settle the claim if you have a valid claim. But what happens is the lawyer tries to get you a better settlement than the insurance company is offering you. So in a no-fault situation, it limits what they can do to be able to get higher awards. So they're obviously concerned 
because the people that they're trying to litigate on behalf of and help uh, have damages that are outside of what the company would have paid. Okay, thank you. And there's a third question. Uh, where do I find my insurance papers online? I'm not sure if that's specific to your company or any number of companies, I guess. Uh, uh, so insurance. So I'm wondering, so there's um, your liability slip, which is um, if that's if that's what you're asking about your uh, certificate of insurance, or your pink card that you drive around with, that can be in digital form now. It does have to be, uh, it can't be a picture of your pink card though. So it does have to be an actual document, like the document, not just a snapshot of it. Uh, depending, so with, uh, we do have an app at Orbit um, that we, we you can um, get into it and find your own information. Uh, they can also send you a digital copy from the office. And I think most of the insurance providers nowadays, you, nowadays you can get a digital uh, pink card so that you don't have to carry the, the physical one around. I think that answers it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what does insurance say about leaving a car in Arizona from January to December? Oh, they say no, thank you. <laughs> <Most cases. laughs> um, insurance companies have, um, you, you're certainly able to operate the vehicle outside of the jurisdiction you insure it in, or we wouldn't be traveling very far. But they do have a, most of them have a, a certain amount of time that they're willing to cover the vehicle for um, without a surcharge. Sometimes they'll surcharge it. Sometimes they can't cover it if it's outside of Canada for too long. And you might be better off to uh, have an American company insure it. The other thing is, um, if, if nothing has changed, I, now this is just information I recall from a, a long time ago. I believe Arizona is one of the... Um, States that has an incredibly low like $25,000 liability limit or something like they don't they don't handle insurance the same way down there in all cases and uh, so so Canadians are incredibly overinsured by the standards of everyone else on the road um, not overinsured by loss not overinsured in that function but you know like a sitting duck would be a pretty good analogy because they see your plates and they know that um, criminals do uh, so it's not that it can't be covered, but it's probably better covered in an American by an American insurance company. But um, contact your broker directly or your insurance company provider directly and find out if it's covered or not if you're leaving it there that long. Okay, sounds great. Going back to our first question on the uh, no fault element, uh, yep. the the same poster uh, says. So, so, does that mean that your rates will go up regardless of who is at fault? No, no, that's not, um, it doesn't. It really, what it does is the no fault is that um, the settlement is all contained. The details of the settlement is all contained within the policy. The terms and conditions are contained within it. And then um, uh, much like uh, the minor tissue, so like whiplash, minor soft tissue injury, there's a cap on how much they'll pay for that. This is the concern of the Trial Lawyers Association on with respect to the no fault. So um, if you get uh, rear-ended and you have whiplash or soft tissue injury, there is an amount of money, a limitation that is payable, and it doesn't matter what you do. You can go to court, you can get a lawyer, you can scream, you can throw things, and you will still only get what you're paid for because that is what's available. That's how much you get paid in that circumstance. I believe the concern of the Trial Lawyers Association is that the entire insurance policy will turn more into that as opposed to being able to litigate for damages that are outside of that amount. So instead of saying, you know, a million dollars is a settlement, it'll be 20,000 and they really don't want to be limited in that fashion. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. There was one about whether this... Uh will be, if, if we have recorded this, it's going to be available online. And the answer to that is yes, we will post uh, this online down the line, uh, probably a couple of weeks. Um, and I don't see any other questions there. So that being the case, I would like to 
thank you, Lori, for presenting with us and thank the attendees for joining. A reminder to please complete the short online survey that you will be receiving to help us continue to improve our presentations. And with that, uh, we will now conclude our webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.